that are hard to find because uh, <laughs> holy shit, this movie was damn near impossible to find unless you're a fan of it being dubbed in Russian. And then, my friends, Stress Benye, Harry, Harry, and Utonto. Like, okay, here we are, I guess. <laughs> yeah, what was that all about? Uh, it was, for whatever reason, the version that I was able to find was dubbed in Russian. It had a Russian and English audio track. I went to the old standard public library and got a copy there. Wow. You're well, living you're living a true you're living a true cosmopolitan life when you go to the library for a DVD. I'll give you that. <laughs> I rarely do that cuz I own so many but I didn't have this one. Well, especially a title like Harry and Tonto cuz that that was released I think it was issued in the I want to say the early 2000s around 2002 2003 something like that and I actually have uh, the Japanese Blu-ray of it. It was released in on Blu-ray in Japan, and you have to kind of find places that sell those, but I do have a high-definition Blu-ray copy of it uh, because it has never been made the Blu-ray transition in America and probably won't now um, at all because Disney owns this title uh, because they uh, swallowed the 20th Century Fox studio and library whole with one big bite. And yeah. Unfortunately, that's... you know what they say. You know what they say. Ma- how mice feel about cats, especially cats that Art <laughs> Carney is holding. <laughs> Get that cat away from me, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. If you are not aware as to what we are talking about on this episode of the Culture Cast, I am still your host, Chris Stashu, much to the chagrin of many, and I am joined by two people who have never been on this show before. But if you've listened to a little show called The Life and Times of Barney Miller. Captain Barney Miller, you've heard my friend Otto Bruno on there before. Otto Bruno, writer of such books as From the Files of the Old One Two. It's a Barney mm-hmm. Miller book that you can go find on the internet. He's also a writer, a teacher, freelancer, man about town. You can find him every Sunday. Is that right, Otto? Yes, correct. When, every, and where where can people find you every Sunday? Every Sunday on jazz901.org from 12 to 3 Eastern time. I host uh, a couple different shows, basically focusing on the great American songbook, the classics of the great American songbook. So from the from the pen of people like Irving Berlin and Cole Porter and that kind of music. My friend and yours, he's soon to be your friend, Otto Bruno. Yeah, you've already heard him talk, so there you go. Oh, and you. Uh, a, another another new face to the show, he is the home entertainment correspondent for Movie Geeks United, and he has a lot of cool movie posters in, a, in his apartment. He already showed us. Your friend and mine, soon to be your friend, Adam Long. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, you kind of introduced the point of this episode, which was I had no idea what to program this month. I think everybody's coming off of that, the high of Halloween and the spooky month and whatever the fuck. And I was just like, I don't know what to do for November. So I just started going through Wikipedia, looking. I kind of went down this weird rabbit trail of clicking on actors, looking at things that they've been in or worked on that I'd never heard of, and then kind of just investigating those movies and saying, oh, okay, like, this looks interesting. Why don't we do this? Little did I know that we'd be talking about a movie that uh, I wish had more people watching it. Like, how can someone win an Oscar for best performance and the movie be effectively lost? <laughs> it's straight. That's a strange quandary, isn't it? I mean, I know we probably all have differing feelings on the award system, but how you can lose a movie effectively, like you said, with Disney swallowing it up is just... Feels like kind of a shame. Yeah, this is true. And, you know, it's a real controversial uh, Academy Award winner, too, we might add, uh, because this was the same year that Al Pacino was up for The Godfather Part Two in the same category. And so a lot of people, there's been a lot of controversy in the ensuing years, and a lot of people feel like Art Carney was given it as a sympathy vote and that he, you know, that, you know, he's, I think he deserved it. Uh, Pacino is great. Uh, you know, Godfather too. There's nothing you can say that's, I mean, it's, that hasn't been said already about his performance there. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's extraordinary, but so is Art Carney. And so in this film, I think, and I don't know about you guys, uh, but I think it, Art Carney plays it just perfectly in Harry and Tonto. He, he, um, if you put another actor in there, they could have played it more broadly, gone for the comic effect. And we can talk about that. Some of the other casting choices that Mazursky had in mind. I've done a little bit of research on this, so I can talk to the, speak to that a little bit uh, as we go on. But uh, I think 
you know, Art Carney does just a, such a wonderful, wonderful job and, and just um, plays it just perfectly. So, you know, it's like choosing between your children or, you know, I guess, and because these performances both to me are equal. Anyway. So like Adam mentioned on this episode of the Culture Cast, we're going to be talking about 1974's Paul Mazursky directed Art Carney starring Harry and Tonto. First, he gave you Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. And then, Bloom in Love. And now, a new film from Paul Mazursky, Harry and Tonto. Most people think that being old is nothing but sitting around in the park feeding pigeons. That's because they haven't met Harry Coombs. He's 72, and believe it or not, he's got a lot in common with you. You dumb son of a... He has girl troubles. When did you last sleep with a woman? Saturday night. March. 1951. He's got family problems. My brother is insane. I don't like that bird. He's getting hassled by the law. Rage, blow, good stuff, hurricane. But Harry still has hopes and dreams. Now, when I was your age, I did a lot of foolish things. Then again, I still do a lot of foolish things. So he's packing up his faithful sidekick, Tonto and running away from home. Uh, my cat has to relieve himself. You're not supposed to have any animals on a vehicle. I need something to get me to Chicago. 20th Century Fox invites you to hit the road with Harry and Tonto. Are you Jewish? <laughs> no, I, I'm into Zen Buddhism these days. You want to chase around a little bit? <laughs> and Harry and Norman. You taking any of these drugs? LSD? Psilocybin? Heroin? You're a good boy, Norman. Harry and Ginger. Ginger, how old are you? 16. Well, I guess I don't know what it's like to be 16 these days. Neither do I. Harry and Jesse. Do you remember me? Sure, I remember you. You're still very beautiful. Thank you, Alex. Harry and Stephanie. My name is Harry Coombs. Stephanie. How are you, Stephanie? You in show business? I'm a hooker. Harry and Eddie. I'll help you find a place. You help me find a place. You know a good broker? I'm a broker. Harry and the con man. Now ease your wonder vitamin. You rub it in, you can swallow it. I advise you to do both. Good for your heart, good for your head, and good for your sex. Harry and the medicine man. Can you cure bursitis? Oh, hello. Absolutely amazing. I love my work. Harry and Shirley. You love me? No, I'll tell you something, Harry. I don't always like you, but I I do love you. Art Carney and Ellen Burstyn in Paul Mazursky's Harry and Tonto. So the film was directed, uh, like I said, by Paul Mazursky. It was released August 12th, 1974. It stars Art Carney as Harry Coombs, a man who gets kicked out of his New York apartment to because they're building a fucking parking lot and him and his cat named Tonto go on a road trip for the ages from one coast to the other meeting and running into all kinds of people and well, learning a thing or two about that little experience we all share called life. So Otto, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the opportunity to answer first here and then we'll go to Adam. When was the first time you saw this movie and what did you think you were rewatching it for the culture cast? Well, you know, Chris, uh, from listening to the culture cast and from listening to the projection booth, I knew you were going to ask me when the first time was that I saw this. Uh, I always find that question amazing because as I assumed I would be, and I, I'm going to still say I'm pretty sure I am, uh, I'm definitely the oldest person on this uh, panel tonight. Um, I have effectively been watching films for half a century and um, most of those films, I cannot remember when the hell I watched them the first time. Uh, this one, although I'm old enough to have watched it at the theater, I did not see it at the theater, uh, really wasn't a appealing uh, title for a 10-year-old in 1974. <laughs> but, um, I couldn't imagine it would be. <laughs> but I, uh, I saw this uh, the first time about... 15 years ago, I would say. I think I saw it on uh, TCM or one of those uh, cable channels. And I had always wanted to see it because I had heard of it. Um, but I had never seen it before. And I liked it the first time I saw it. Um, but I will definitely say re-watching it for, for 
tonight's uh, podcast, uh, I definitely, I didn't like it anymore. I loved it now. Um, oh, swerve, swerve. Right. And I, I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and, I, and I think it probably has to do <laughs> with the fact uh, that although I'm, I'm still a, a bit of ways from the age that Harry Combs is supposed to be, which I think is around 72 or something like that. Uh, I am, believe it or not, four years older than Art Carney was when he made this film um, because he played about about 17 years older than he actually was uh, when he made this film. And um, Mazursky talked about, you know, when he first approached Carney with the idea of playing uh, Harry Combs. And in fact, apparently Mazursky wanted Jimmy Cagney to play the role. And Cagney told him, no, I'm retired, I'm done, which of course Cagney had retired in 61 after one, two, three. And um, this was 1973 when he approached Cagney and Cagney said no. And Cagney, I think he said, suggested Jimmy Stewart, but 20th Century Fox apparently wanted, they weren't real confident in this film. So they wanted a TV uh, personality, like someone who was recognizable and marketable for television because they figured if worse came to worse and they just run it on TV, they'd at least get a good audience that way. So he went to Carney. And Carney initially turned it down and said, I'm not old enough to play this. And Mazursky said, well, Art, you've got a hearing aid. Uh, if you don't, if you don't wear a piece or, you know, you don't color your hair, your hair's gray and you're balding on top. If you don't hide your limp, he actually had a natural limp because he had, had been, uh, he had shrapnel in his leg from World War II. Um, he said, and but Carney used to try to hide that in some of his uh, roles. He said, if you don't hide the limp, he says, trust me, you can play 72. <laughs> and uh, and of course, Mazursky was right. And um, uh, Carney was, I agree with Adam. I mean, I, I think Carney, I know because of preparing for tonight's podcast, I did some research as well and, and discovered how controversial an Oscar win it was for him. But I agree with Adam. I, I, I think he's just incredible in this role. I mean, really, really great. And, you know, I'll, we'll talk later about some of the things Mazursky said about Carney's acting in this. But I, I think he, I, I loved it. I loved the film uh, even more than the first time I had ever seen it. And I probably because I'm closer to that age now. <laughs> what about you, Adam? Well, uh, I was aware of this film. My my dad had a, a book uh, when I was growing up in the 70s. I'm going to date myself. I'm just a few uh, years younger than you, Otto, by the way. But <laughs> no, well, you, look, you, you look better than I do, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, Jesus, so, Otto. Whatever I can get. But uh, Otto, you know, Otto Bruno, ladies and gentlemen, just an amoeba <laughs> with eyes. So uh, th there you go. I don't know. This is not a video medium. So, uh, you know. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll you tell you. younger than I'm, I do. I am 52, and I, I, for, I first started going to the movies in about 1974, so I'm not far behind you. Uh, but this wasn't one of the films I saw in 74. Uh, I, my I just want to say you had both a... look good for your age. I'm just putting this out there for both of y'all, just so you know. So none of this, I'm a little, yeah, you both look good for your age. Nah. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right, good, Adam. We right got back. what we wanted. <laughs> right, you, all right. The, the show's right, over. Episode's it. over. Exactly. We're out of here. <laughs> but no, my, my dad had a book on the history of the, the Academy Awards uh, when I was a child. Uh, you know, I was probably second, third grade, and I was just always interested in films ever since going to see The Towering Inferno at the age of four. That was the one that did it for me. And so uh, I became obsessed, movie crazy, after seeing The Towering Inferno. My parents took me when I was four years old, which is really crazy when I think about it. But uh, anyway, uh, I remember there was a section in there about Harry uh, and Tonto um, and, the, and the Oscar win for that. And so I was aware of the film probably when I was in second, third, fourth grade. And it wasn't until the mid 1990s when I finally caught up to it. It was on uh, FXM, the uh, Fox movie channel that uh, used to be on cable. And I don't I, I don't think that's around anymore. But uh, that's where I first saw it. I was in my mid 20s by that time. And again, much like Otto, I liked it. I admired the film. Can't say I loved it. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, I thought, well, that's good and it's fine and yada, yada, yada. And again, around 20, 2005, I was visiting with my mother and I said, let's just put this on and uh, watch it. Well, I just, uh, you know, having gone, having lived quite a bit of life between <laughs> the mid nineties and up until 2015, when I, uh, 
saw this again, it was a, really a revelation. Uh, and I think the key to this film is that you have to have lived to appreciate it. You have to have suffered some loss. You have to be able to, uh, being a, a young man in my early 20s, I, I couldn't appreciate it because I had not gone through the things that I've gone through in the last several decades. And I've gone through uh, some some really, you know, tumultuous storms um, uh, over the years. And I've, I've weathered them, thank goodness. But I think that is the key to, to this film and uh and rewatching it again uh, just it cemented what i already had thought of it the last time i saw it so it uh, but it just gets better every time for me. It resonates uh, more and more and more. So that's uh, that's uh, my uh, shaggy dog version of the answer to the question you asked. But <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so as for me, I had never seen Harry and Tonto. I, like I said, was just kind of perusing the Internet, looking for things to watch. And I saw again, I'm not a Oscar person. I think that I mean, again, like with any award ceremony, it's less about merit and more about what's popular or not popular, but trying to virtue signal with certain things. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I had seen the controversy around it because, yeah, obviously Godfather 2, you know, uh, they mentioned it in Scream 2. What movies are better than the original? Well, Godfather 2 comes up because it's widely considered to be better than the original. I don't think so. I'm not one of those people. I like the original more. The original also has Abe Vigoda in it. Second one doesn't. So there's that. (laughs) (laughs) Got to keep it real at all times for Barney Miller, Otto. There you go. (laughs) You like that? This is the only reason I like the first one. It's because it has a begoated. Um, actually, I think I think the first one works better because it's less of a story about the family. It's more a story about the families. The second movie is about the family, as in the Corleones. I'm more interested sure. in less Corleone stuff, more the world, which, you know, mm-hmm. it's a, that's a me problem, not a movie problem. But I had seen all the controversy because, yeah, obviously – Big performances in that movie, important performances in that movie. Pacino's performance in that movie is amazing. And Art Carney gets the Oscar for a movie where he's with a cat all movie. So I was thinking to myself, like, that's a pretty subversive and interesting pick. Clearly it was at the time. What better way to kick off uh, a month where I have no idea what I'm doing theme wise by just a a strange movie about Art Carney and a cat? Yeah, I cried at the end of this movie, guys. Really hard. Like really hard. I was full on tears. My cat's sitting right here. My cat is sitting in his bed right next to me. Ah. I am married. I, you know, like, again, I haven't lived the life of the character of Harry Coombs, but it's not hard to put yourself in that position. And like you mentioned, Adam, this movie, I guarantee if I watch this movie 20, 30 years from now, probably be me crying the whole time. Uh, But to both of your points, it's a movie that I think obviously it benefits from uh, distance from the film in your own life, you know, increasing your life experience and then coming back to it. And I, I think, and I'm sure we could go around the horn here and talk all about it, but this movie is similar to a, a, a small selection of other movies that the first time you watch it, you're just not going to get that same gut punch feeling or even get the same thing out of it that you would the second or third time. And yeah, that's the case with a lot of film, but, with something like this, like show this to a 20 year old. They're going to be like, the fuck ever. Like right. I've never lived a life longer than 20 years. I mean, Art Carney's character is supposed to be in his seventies. So he's lived seven decades worth of life. And it's, it's, it's that kind of rumination and musing on mortality and life and your place in the world that I appreciate. Cause those are the kinds of stories I like. And who the hell doesn't love a road movie? Like really like a, a good solid road movie and this is a good solid mid 70s road movie that not only is a road movie but it also takes you to 70s new york which is a great setting 70s chicago which is a great setting and 70s la which is a great setting like this is the kind of movie where i would like to be in the backseat of the car with art carney and the movie does a very good job of kind of placing you in that world with him at all times i mean he's essentially we never are without him throughout the movie. I believe he's it's, we follow him almost entirely. So it it really just continues to reinforce in my mind whose story it is, what the story is about. And obviously what a cute cat, what a great cat actor, cat eating chicken out of a bucket. 
Like by the way, um, Mazursky uh, on the commentary was saying that how how really great this cat was. They had two cats apparently, but he said you know this there was one that they used far more often, and um, I guess Mazursky was a cat person. Carney told Mazursky, although Mazursky said he wasn't. He wasn't certain if he really believed Carney, but Carney told him that um, the only pet he had, he opened up a drawer and pilled out a rock. <laughs> that I've ever had. He goes, I don't have to, I don't have to feed it. I don't have to give it water. I don't have to take it out to pee. And he threw it. So he says he kind of pretended like he didn't like cats. He says, but as you can see in the movie, he's really wonderful with the cat. So, um, but you know, it's funny uh, going back, not to beat a dead cat, but going back to <laughs> going back to the controversy about the Oscar win, um, everybody talks about that, but you know, somebody obviously voted for him. And uh, Chris, it sounds like maybe you and I are, are kind of similar. I'm not I don't put a lot of value or weight into awards uh, and particularly something like the Academy Awards. I mean, it's it is primarily a political thing. And but what's amazing to me and, and you <laughs> you opened the door because you mentioned Dave Vigoda. It it made me think of the fact that like in, in the 70s when Barney Miller came out, Abe Vigoda's character of Fish, who was the oldest guy in the squad room, and they talked a lot about his age and his various uh, health issues and all that stuff. He ends up surprisingly, shockingly becoming the breakout character in those first couple seasons. People loved him. And it made me think of that when I was watching this film, because I'm like, well, obviously somebody voted for him. So maybe in 1974, the Academy membership was still skewing older because maybe, you know, the older people were voting for this because remember, it wasn't just um, Al Pacino who lost. It was Jack Nicholson. For Chinatown. <laughs> Chinatown. That's true. It was Dustin Hoffman for Lenny. And it was um, Albert, Albert Finney. Uh, what was it? I can't remember. Murder on the Orient Express. Oh, yes. Murder on the Orient Express. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, I want to say if one of those people had one, if Albert Finney had one. I mean, I've seen Murder on the Orient Express. It's good. Right. But, I mean, he's a good part of that movie. Right. Sure. Th like, this movie without Art Carney, I don't know if this movie even works very well. Like, there's something about Art Carney's, like, hangdog expression constantly and his look and his believability as this role. He he is that character. It's not a character like that. That's the more I watched it. And I, I watched Harry and Tonto three times now. Every time I watch it, I realize more and more it's it, there is not a character here. This is just he embodies this role. And that was that. That's the right. way it seems like he just melts away. It may not even be it maybe isn't even a role. I know we've kind of already mentioned his age disparity versus the the film, but he just embodies it so naturally that it you forget that you're watching a movie. Yeah. And you make the good point that that as I mean, there were some great uh, supporting players in this film, but in many ways it is almost like a one man show. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because he's in every every scene. Yeah, he's and he makes you 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 buy his journey because of his commitment to the the role. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I totally agree. Yeah, it's um uh you spoke earlier of, of having uh wet at the end of the film. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's five spots in this film. The lat this recent viewing uh, that I did in preparation for the show. There were five times. That oh I wow. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So what were what were the what were what were some of the other down. moments? Yeah. Yeah. Go. I want. I want to hear it. I want to hear notes. it. Well, the opening credits got me, uh, which I don't think ever happened before, and that was done. That was achieved um, by stealing shots. He did that. Uh, just hit a camera in the bushes and stole shots of uh, elderly people in the park or whatever. And it's a combination of the Bill Conti score and the shots of these elderly people in the park. And I don't know, it just, I started to well up just seeing that, that combination of that, that Bill Conti music. And then there's the scene that's so well done where his friend uh, that he he's established, they've established that he's got this friend that he talks to on a regular basis. And then 
they don't show, and this is a, a, a testament to Mazursky's uh, abilities as a writer, they don't show you his death. You know, there's no warning. His son just drops Harry off at, at this building and you don't know what it is. And he goes in and his friend is die has died and he's got to identify the body. And, you know, he's pretty stoic for a moment or two there. And then he turns away and he and he silently, you know, just kind of uh, loses it just a little bit. But, you know, not tremendously, but just enough. Well, that got to me. <laughs> and then there was the uh, the dancing scene with the uh the his girlfriend from years gone by who's obviously suffering from some form of dementia or something like that and again the bill conti score uh just the way that the, the, that scene is shot and then melanie myron the camera pulls back and she's watching them as this is happening the, the girl that he's picked up as a hitchhiker and uh that's just so beautifully done too and of course the death of tonto i no spoil i didn't mean to spoil anything for anybody but you know uh he, he statute does. of limitations on spoilers for this show is <laughs> 10 years and this is where we're we're, we're, <laughs> we're long yes past. so anyway the death of Tonto is is also very very moving, and then of course the end scene where you know it's like the cycle of life has has we've gone the complete cycle of life, and it's almost like a resurrection for Harry uh, as you know the sun is uh, uh, beaconing, I guess you would say maybe uh, on the the coast there, with and there the child is building castles, and he bends over to gently help them or assist them in that. And uh, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's very moving. It's <laughs> all of that got to me. So, you know, it's like, this is a weep fest. I don't know if I've reached that age. but <laughs> <it's> <laughs> Well, and I, I think, you know, I, not that I don't cry during movies. I, I, right. I, it's just for me, for me with something like this, again, it just, it's so naturalistic that it, it, again, it barely feels like a movie in a lot of ways. Like I, obviously there's a lot of recognizable actors, Cliff, a very young Cliff de Young being just like <laughs> yes. the most unrepentant turd and, and uh, zero Mostel's uh, son, Joshua Gosh, Mostel, yeah. who's fantastic. Uh, and then obviously Ellen Burstyn and, you know, uh, Larry Hagman for a couple minutes, but mm-hmm. like we've mentioned with, without just this, complete committal to the role that art carney has i don't know if if i'm i don't know if i am feeling the way i feel by the end of the movie like you said this, it's this full circle journey but it's also this weird kind of rumination on how the old and the young are interpreted and seen by i guess the middle aged because there's this yeah. there's the weird thing right because like you mentioned melanie myron kind of is picked up by him about like a third of the way into the movie. And she stays with him through most of the second and a little bit into the third act. But you get the sense that similarly to Art Carney, she is out of sorts in the time and place that she's in as well. She's running Mm -hmm. away like he is. And I think it's really interesting because they they always, you know, they being society at large, kind of has seemingly always commented on or made it clear that the young and the old probably have more in common than either one really understand. And the middle, like the middle aged people are the ones that don't get them anymore. And I hear it now, like as a, you know, a 30 year old, it's like, oh, the young kids and their fucking weird stuff. And it's like, guys, we were, that was us 10 years ago. Stop this shit right now. Like, don't pretend you're out of sorts with people. And then it's the same thing with the older folks, with people that are older than me. It's like, that person's 10 years older than you and you don't understand them. Because that's kind of part of the message of this movie is the lack of common ground between the people that are middle-aged and the old and the people that are middle-aged and the young. But it's it's also, it's not just, if I might suggest, it's not just the age alone. It's also the fact of what you're seeing in this film a little bit is the difference in the relationships between parent and child and parent and grandchild. And even Mazursky, I, I don't know if I read this or if I heard it on the commentary track or in a different interview or something, but you know, he was saying how I and and uh, I have grown children now. Unfortunately, I'm not lucky enough yet to be a grandparent. I hope at some point, but um but it's a very different, very different dynamic of how you deal 
with your kid as opposed to how you deal with your grandchild because your grandchild you don't have the pressure you don't feel the pressure with a grandchild that you feel with a child and i can say this as a parent for sure that you know you're raising a child and you are responsible for everything Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know do you have total control over how that child turns out? No, you don't have total control over that. Do you feel total responsibility? Yes, you do. <laughs> so there, that's what I think creates tension sometimes between parent and child. And then you don't have that with uh, parent and grandchild, particularly in this film. I mean, the way that um, uh, Carney relates to Josh Mostel's character from the very beginning is just fabulous because Carney doesn't judge him in any way. Uh, the way I, you know, the way you're given the feeling that, that he feels his parents do or his older brother does or whatever, you know, uh, Carney just talks to him very calmly, even though, you know, there's that whole part at the beginning where Josh Mastel is, is silent. He's not speaking or anything. And, and Carney doesn't say, what are you doing that stupid shit for? You know, he just talks to him like he's a real human being. He says, why is there a is there a reason? Is there a plan behind this? No speaking. Like, where does it come from? The, he just kind of nods yes. And he says, have you read about it? And he says, yes. And he shows him books. And he's like, oh, I'd like to read some of these books. So, I mean, he's really interested in in his grandson in a very non-judgmental way and that is sort of what you're talking about with you know people who are much older um the older you get the closer you get to the end so you realize how unimportant so much of the middle bullshit is (laughs) and the younger and you also in in an odd way maybe because of that when you're that much older you realize how much pressure the younger people are, are under and how stressed out they are over things that you know, maybe in another 50 years won't be important to them, but are very important to them now. Um, And of course, the whole relationship with his three kids is really interesting because you have all these, uh, you know, the the oldest child, which I'm assuming is he's the oldest child. uh, Phil, Phil Bruns. Yeah, he's a I assume I assume so. Right. Right. A Barney Miller alumni, by the way. And uh, <laughs> um, and he's that kid who's concerned about his father. He's very responsible. He's very, you know, a little uptight and all that stuff. But he does, from everything we can see, seem to genuinely love his father. And then we see his only child, which, I mean, his only um, daughter, excuse me, which again, even though it's weird that there's moving that way, but you get the feeling is maybe the middle child. And the two of them are constantly arguing. Maybe they're a little too much alike, but they love each other. But she doesn't, you notice, I always find this very interesting. She doesn't call him Pop like the older son does. She calls him by his name, Harry. Um, And then he goes to see the, you know, the more irresponsible youngest child in California, uh, played by Larry Hagman. And and the re- the way he relates to all of them is, is really interesting. And by the way, uh, Adam... Uh, being the film aficionado he is, probably has seen this film, but there's an Italian movie called Stano Tutti Bene, or Everybody's Fine, made with Marcello oh, yes. Mastriani, and oh, I forgot what year it was, but it's kind of has a similar vibe to this, because he goes around Italy visiting his adult children to kind of see what their lives are really like, and I, that's all I could, that's one of the big things that this this film made me think about when I saw it. So if uh, if you haven't seen it, Chris, I would yeah. encourage you. you, you From one eye tie it. to another. It was... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it was re- remade with uh, Robert De Niro, although I didn't see the remake. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> but it's from the same director who uh, Giuseppe Tornatore, uh, Giuseppe Tornatore, Tornatore maybe, uh, who directed uh, Cinema Paradiso, which right. obviously a, a best foreign film Oscar winner and a fantastic movie, uh, I must say, for anybody who's a f- serious fan of cinema. Uh, yeah, that's all that is is uh, very interesting. The dynamics between the uh, the children and the grandchildren. That's excellent points. I would agree. And but and, you know another thing about this film is how Mazursky subverts expectation uh, with people that Harry meets along the way. And I'll 
give one example, uh, the car salesman. He goes to get the car and uh, you think for a second that this guy might just rip him off. You're just waiting and the guy's telling him all these stories about how he can uh, still get an erection by taking strychnine and uh, <laughs> <laughs> all this stuff and you know it's like yeah this guy boy he's a shyster you know but the guy is a good-hearted serious i mean he's really you know he's he's exactly what you think he is just a just a, a nice guy who likes to tell stories and uh but you know he kind of sets it up in a way that you know you're thinking oh boy he's gonna get ripped off here and he just subverts expectations uh in many instances in the film and that's just one that comes to mind uh for me but um just wonderfully done wonderfully done you know adam that is that's an excellent excellent point because you're right he does it throughout the film and what's really was what was fascinating to me and me and i thought of it as i was watching it again yesterday was it's made in the 70s <laughs> there are a lot of 70s films where guys get in those types of situations in a road movie like that and it could have turned a very different, ugly way than it does in this particular film. I mean, I thought the same thing with the prostitute. You know, is she going to, like, rob him? Is she going to, you know, you don't know what she's going to do. Ultimately, she just tires him out. I mean, you know, it's great. (laughs) But that's a great point. You're right. He does that throughout the film. He just kind of (laughs) baits and switches on you. (laughs) <laughs> and what uh, what do you guys think about the influence of this film on, say, Alexander Payne? Because I'm seeing a lot of the influence on this film in, say, Sideways and Nebraska that uh, Alexander Payne would go on to make in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, I can feel the influence. Uh, well, those are both rogue movies. And I, I see uh, definitely some influence for, of the uh, Harry and Tonto variety in those films. <laughs> I was just wondering if you guys. I know I completely agree. agree. I mean, it's. I I think. I think it's a. I think it's like a style of road movie. There's like three or four kinds of road movies. There's the fun, jokey kind. Like uh, I know Pee Wee's Big Adventure is probably a terrible example, but it is a road movie, and it is. (laughs) It's a fun road movie. And then you have something like uh, like Otto. You're kind of mentioning a little bit more bad which is like the hitcher which is kind of the horror road movie and then you have this like introspective road movie where it's it's about it's not about the journey that the characters are going on as much as the journey that the character is being taken on unbeknownst to them and and alexander mm-hmm. payne kind of does the same thing where you have the character we've established the character and then they're just being taken, you know, they're going, but they're being taken through all these scenarios like with the hooker, or the prostitute, and then the, I guess you would say the health salesman and then, you know, Chief Dan George. I mean, everything in this movie is somewhat subversive, but at the same time, it exists to kind of, like you mentioned, Adam, it has that feel like it's just like it's it's a it's a character study as a road. And Alex Alexander Payne, man, that yeah, sure. I mean, I think he's mastered it now at this point. <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody does it better right now. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else is really doing it. But well, another good example of it, I think, that uh, was around the same time would be Scarecrow uh, with Al Pacino and Gene Hackman. That's another example of this same type of genre of film that you're referring to where it's more of a, a serious introspective because it, it has that same vibe and that was a uh, uh, released a year prior to this one so i i don't know that that there was any influence for mazursky and having seen scarecrow but it's there's certainly um i can i would say they may be well i mean one of the cousins. posters that you have on your wall is a red movie <laughs> i mean pa- paper paper moon which came out That's a year before paper this moon. Is is a road movie and in the seventies? I can say the seventies were a great time for road movies, but you know, I I'm in the minority of people that don't like Duel. But Duel opens up the seventies and seventy one with road movies, and then Tulane Blacktop, Badlands, Paper Moon, Scarecrow. This movie, Jesus, Mm -hmm. every. You know, every decade kind of has its genre. I'm not going to say road movies were the genre in the seventies, but I mean. I think of when I think of movies from the 70s, there's a lot of people on motorcycles and on cars running around on the roads of America. This movie fits perfectly in there. I, I honestly, this I don't want to say this is like a new favorite, but this is a movie I'm so glad I have finally seen after essentially never having heard of it until about a month ago. And now 
I've talked about it more in the last week since I watched it the first time than I do most things that I watch for this show. Not everything that I watch, as I'm sure with both of y'all, makes an impact on me. A lot of things is just, oh, this was fun. This was good. I'm glad I watched it. Now let's move on to the eight other things we have to watch. This is, I rarely watch a movie three times in a week. Like that's not a thing. For me, that's not a thing. For plenty of other people, I'm sure it is. For me, that's not a thing. And I think that's a testament to this movie and these kinds of movies. Holy shit, the fucking Blues Brothers ends the decade for road movies in 80. You know, I mean, I talk about another road movie. And and one of my favorite road movies, the Muppet movie, comes out in 79. So, <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, this is, you can't help but say that, I mean, this is definitely a road movie. I mean, that I think is first and foremost what you think of when you watch it. But you also just uh, used the phrase a couple moments ago, a character study, because really there's there's not a lot of exciting action that happens in this. It is exactly that. It is a character study, but it's a really compelling one, and it's a really moving one. And um, you know, again, going back, it's touching all the the emotional spots you know with the parents and children parents and grandchildren uh friends who have been friends for forever uh first loves uh you know and the and the the horrible things that age does to us you know because that was interesting uh adam said something about how he he started getting emotional just at the very opening of the film because they're showing all of those shots of the old people. And what I noticed when I watched that is most of those shots that they had at the beginning of the film, not all of them, but most of them were all old people alone. They were by themselves. There weren't a lot of, of shots where they were with someone else talking. It was They were almost all, you know, solitary. And you think, oh man, they're going to show you how this guy is, is all, he's old and now he's alone and he doesn't have anybody. And again, going back to Adam's point about subverting expectations, no, he has, he has friends, he has family, he has, you know, he's, he still has his wits about him. He's very bright. He's a, he's a, an ex English teacher. He's still quoting Shakespeare. I mean, it, it's it, it's not like he's failing. It's just that kind of sad reality that he's at that point in his life. Because at one point, the daughter says to him, "I want you to teach. You're too smart to stop doing anything. I want you to teach." And he says, "I'm too old." But then you notice at the end, he does say he starts tutoring people. Um, so, you know, part of it was, although you don't, he, he plays this character in a very unsentimental way. You know what I mean? It's not, he doesn't. That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, he doesn't, he, he's not maudlin. He's not seeking your pity or anything. Um, well, I don't feel like there's any pity to give, right. you know, like ultimately what, well, you know, what's funny. And this is kind of insane is the beginning, like. After that, you know, talk about heart jerkers, the first five minutes of Up, pretty gnarly for anybody who has a heart. (laughs) Is this movie's, like, conceit not similar to Up, at least the general conceit of a man, an older man who has, quote, no place in society, so he leaves? In that movie, he flies away in his balloon house. In this movie, he just, I'm going on the road. It, it's, it's, I, I, like you mentioned, Otto, it's interesting the anti sentimentality. I mean, he says at one point, I'm not a fan of long goodbyes. And he sticks with that throughout to the point where with Tonto, he's like, goodbye, old friend, and doesn't even look back. He just goes. It's, it's that, that role is so unlike what I was expecting, even. It's, it's so matter of fact. It's just, I'm old. And the world doesn't think that it has a place for me. And because it thinks it doesn't have a place for me, I don't think I have a place in the world. And he finds out very quickly once he gets out West, clearly not the case. Yeah. And that's, and that brings up another point. The only uh, type of thing that in society that's still okay to discriminate against is being old. That seems to be still okay. Even though we're, we've, we've advanced and come so far in so many areas, that is one area that just doesn't seem to be, Nothing ever seems to change. And that struck me seeing that film, uh, you know, how that was presented in that film. And I thought, you know, we just really haven't come very far since then. Um, 
you know, so that that's a that's the one area in which uh, you know it's it's still okay, and I and I I think there's something wrong with that. I think people ought to have uh, some some different attitudes and ideas because there's really something to be said about wisdom and having lived and uh, knowing things. You know, because uh, there's a lot of things I certainly didn't know. Say when I first saw this film, as I said that I know now <laughs> I've learned the hard way. And uh, so I think, um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for all that. Well, I, I, I agree. I mean, like, like you've mentioned, I mean, th- there's this idea of, uh, you know, a, 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 a large body of existence that, you know, Art Carney's character has. And, and like we've mentioned, you can tell that he has lived, he has lived a life. I mean, he says as much in that one scene, he's like, you know, I never thought I had enough time. And I did. And I cried in that scene. I should mention that scene fucked me up mm. big time. Oh, yeah. Cause I mean, it's, it's something that I struggle with every day. Like every day I feel like I don't have enough time for whatever it is. And you see in that scene, he's like, I, I didn't think I had enough time. And I did. And I took advantage of it. What do I have to complain about now? And, and it's weird. Like, like you mentioned, Otto, the anti-sentimentality is so atypical for this kind of movie's subject matter in its entirety. Because like you just mentioned, Adam, lots of times it's played this maudlin saccharine bullshit that old people are unable to do anything for themselves. They can't take care of themselves. And some can't. But there are people my age that can't take care of themselves. It's nothing to do with age. It's just people like people in general. But it's so strange to see a movie where it's like he's an old man. But he still has autonomy. He still has the ability to function and do his own things. And he has his shit together more than most of the people in this movie that are younger than him. Clearly, some of them, like the uh, the psychotic Bible quoting hitchhiker <laughs> who is just spouting <laughs> Bible verses. And, you know, that's the last person you put at the wheel of your car, my friend, is that guy. OK, oh, you have a driver's license. Oh, yeah. Come on and drive. Good. Fuck that. No. <laughs> I, I wrote down in my notes, as soon as he said, Jesus loved you, I would have peeled out and left him in the dust because that, that would have scared me. Just like you're saying, Chris, I'm like, no, 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 no. The last thing I would do is offer him yeah. the ability to drive the car. Like, please, no, like, stay away. If he loves you, let him take care of you. Goodbye. Yeah. He's got your best intentions in mind, pal. I'm out of here. He's got your back. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the uh, weird connection this film has to Star Wars, which is a a very odd trajectory. uh, But there is Other than the fact that uh, Disney Uh, now owns this movie? uh, Well, yeah, there's that. (laughs) Um, That's the unfortunate Star Wars connection. (laughs) Well, yeah. Uh, Yeah. And because of the fact that they can't turn this into a franchise, you know, Harry and Tonto 2, (laughs) Harry and Tonto the series... You know, that's why it's this. I would watch Harry, I would watch only... Harry and Tonto the series. I'm I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say <laughs> if, you, if you did that right, like a six to eight episode limited series, I think that would actually be it could be interesting. I mean, it wouldn't have to be Harry yeah, and Tonto, think... but like, you know, a character study on what it means. This movie could work now in our modern day, as long as it wasn't like, oh, the young kids are doing weird stuff because like that's. You know, right. That's not what we're here for. Exactly. But there is a weird uh, tr- uh, uh, connection here. And that is that neither this film nor Star Wars would exist without uh, the um, the foresight of one person. And that would be Alan Ladd Jr., who agreed to finance this film when nobody else would take it, as he did with Star Wars, as we all know. And so Laddie, as he was known by his uh, friends and co-workers and all that stuff, I think he passed away earlier this year, unfortunately. Uh, but this film, uh, Mazursky wrote this script in 1970, which uh, with his uh, a childhood friend, Josh Greenfield, co-wrote the film. And they were just sitting around one day and he said something about, you know, what what's it going to be like when we're 70? He said, that's an interesting idea. And so they... They came up with this idea and he wrote half of it. Friend wrote the other half and then they kind of meshed the two halves together and uh, polished it up and they had it. And uh, uh, Bob and Carol Te- Te- and Ted and Alice was, of course, Mazursky's first film as a director. And it was a pretty, pretty big success. And he thought that he was able would be able to get anything made after that. But uh, Warner Brothers took an option, I think, for about one hundred twenty five thousand or something for the script. And then they decided not 
to do it. And so they just didn't want to do it. And so then he went on to do Alex in Wonderland, which was a flop, and then Bloom in Love, which was a, a success. He And so at that point, uh, he was determined to get Harry and Tonto made. And he just decided, he said, OK, this is the movie I want to make. And so he just started shopping around and... Um, So he was able to get in touch with, uh, he took it over to Fox and Alan Ladd Jr. was running 20th Century Fox. And uh, he said, you know, if we can get this done for under a million dollars, I think we'll uh, we'll let you do it. And so the final tally on the budget, I think, was nine hundred and eighty thousand dollars, what the film uh, was financed for. And uh, they didn't do a lot of rehearsal, from what I understand. This film was pretty much they just shot it and, and went. Uh, not not much rehearsal because they just didn't have the funds or, or nor the time uh, and, and obviously shot on real locations. But that's that's the uh, that's the interesting connection to uh, Star Wars, because Alan, Alan Ladd Jr. took the chance on Star Wars and as he did on Harry and Tonto and and a lot of other great films. Didn't he? He was uh, was he? He was he was the one who rolled the dice on Alien as well. Yeah, that yeah. is correct. That's the yeah. app. Well, and and like you said, I mean, it, this look, I, I I don't know if the seventies is the greatest decade for film, but I think you could make the case for it in a lot. In I would say in a lot of ways, maybe again, I think everybody's opinion will differ, but some of the movies that we've just mentioned are films that people are still talking about. Now there are plenty of films that came out two weeks ago that nobody's talking about anymore. And, and, you know, I was thinking about this the other day when I was in the car I was like, have have all the good movies come out? Are we just playing the same note at a different key at this point? I don't think that's the case. But there's so many things from the 70s that just are still important now or are still affecting the ways that people make film or are informing the ways people make film. And I just, I don't know if someone 10 years from now is going to say, well, I really remember this one shot in the Bye Bye Man that I'm really trying to, to, to ape here. Or remember that shot in the 40-year-old Virgin yeah, we're trying to do something like that. Like, I'm not sure that that's a thing. And I'm not poo-pooing or diminishing those movies because I watch new movies just like y'all do. But it feels like the 70s were a magical time for film that not not that everybody's still trying to recapture, but certain filmmakers now are trying to recapture that spirit in the projects that they work on. And I'm not sure that you can. I think you can probably do a close approximation, somebody like Alexander Payne doing kind of a road movie thing. But at the same time, it's just, I, 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 maybe that's just me. What do you guys think? I don't know. Is that, is this me rambling like the old man in the room? Like oh, all the good movies have come out now and nothing worth watching guys. Like, I well, watch no movies. As the old man in the room, uh, all the great movies have been made. Yes. I agree with that. It's all over. Um, <laughs> today, uh, no more movies need to come out after today. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, what you're saying is interesting because I've always uh, said that my favorite decades for film are the 30s and 40s. And I kind of put those two decades together and the 70s. And I think what you're identifying about the 70s, uh, you know, maybe not consciously realizing it, is I think the 70s still stand out today because there was such a like a sea change of the way the the subject matter that films address the way they address them remember it was it was only 1968 i believe when they finally established the MPAA rating system but prior to that you know you had to be careful about what you said what you showed what you did what you inferred you know all of that stuff And kind of as soon as the shackles were taken off of that, because again, remember, the rating system comes into effect in 1968. In 1969, the best picture was an X-rated film. So, yeah. Right? So, I mean, you know, I think that's why the 70s probably stands out to those of us who love film so much is because you could really feel how new and different and and exciting and vital and revolutionary those films were in the 70s compared to what came before them. And again, this is coming from someone who loves the movies of the 30s and 40s, but the 70s is so different that it was just so exciting. And I I, I don't, I mean, sure, there can still be great movies made today, but I don't think you can recapture something like that because I do think it's a, it's like 
the 30s were probably, you know, in, in many ways, I'm sure there would be film scholars who would say the 30s were that great because it was the first full decade of sound. And they had just spent two decades, you know, doing this, you, you know, using this art form in a silent way. <laughs> so um, it's one of those things that history presents an opportunity. And I don't think you can... I don't think it can be recaptured again. That that level of it. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. And also coupled with the fact that you had people like the previously mentioned Alan Ladd Jr., who actually loved movies. These people, uh, Robert Evans is another example. There are many others that I could cite. Peter Bart, others uh, that loved movies. These people that that were the gatekeepers. They understood that you know business is import is important. We've got to make enough money to cover these movies. But, you know, let's make something that, you know, we would want to see. And it wasn't all about the bean counting, which I think uh, the problem we have in today's society, again, being the old man shouting from the mountaintops, I guess. But uh, we have people with business degrees running studios now who just they didn't grow up on films. They don't care about they don't they're not passionate about it. It's all about the bottom line. And thusly, that's the reason why we're seeing so many sequels and reboots because they don't want to take a chance. They don't want to roll the dice. And, uh, you know, we had, if it wasn't for people like Alan Ladd, we wouldn't have Star Wars. We wouldn't have Alien. We would not have uh, said franchises know, that exist now. <laughs> right. That's Yeah, exactly. We wouldn't have any of that because they took a chance. Somebody, it has to start with somebody. And these people loved film enough to the, to the point where they said, well, you know, I'm going to roll the dice on this. This may go, it may not. Let's take a chance on it. Let's see. Let's see what happens. And now it's all about how they can recoup the greatest amount of money in the least amount of time with the least amount of effort. And that's where we're at in society today, unfortunately. And it's kind of depressing. Um, there are still some great films that that slide through the cracks that if you're paying close enough attention, you may find. But, you know, last year is a good example. I couldn't even come up with a top 10 list last year. And that's the first time in my life. Of, of new movies, you uh, mean? I'm not even like, sure yeah, I could come I, up with fucking two. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I know, I could, uh, yeah, what movies came not. out in 2021? Uh, <laughs> I couldn't even tell you what movies you came know, out last year, to be perfectly honest with you. like, <laughs> Well, it's problematic for me because I'm a member of the Southeastern Film Critics <laughs> Association, and I technically have to come up with, I'm supposed to come up with a top 10 list. Just put all Marvel so at movies. at the end of the year, right, I voted, I voted uh, as I, and you do have to vote in order to maintain your status, and I did do that. Uh, but you know, the best film that I saw last year was the, um, the Kurt Vonnegut documentary, which I thought was that incredible. Was I saw that. Uh, yes. Yeah. That was incredible. And that was a documentary. There wasn't a, a narrative feature film that I could vouch for as being in the top 10 last year, but the, the, uh, the Kurt Vonnegut directed by Robert Whitey, who does a lot of the Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, episodes. And he did the magnificent Woody Allen documentary that was done, aired on PBS about 10 years ago, a uh, four hour documentary, terrific stuff too. So yeah, that, I mean, that's where we're at. I think this year is a little bit better. Maybe COVID had something to do with it, but uh, you know, some of my favorite directors are actually putting stuff out now uh, or most interesting directors. I should say this year, there's uh, I, I did see the new Todd field film tar recently. And I was disappointed with that. I, I love his first two films and this was a, a misfire in my opinion, but you know, hopefully some of the other directors who's putting, who are putting new things out this year will, will be a little bit better, but yeah, it's still, it's still a kind of a dire situation, a cinematic landscape that we live in uh, because I just don't think there are enough of these people who run the studios who really care. And, and I hear this complaint too, being, you know, home video correspondent for our podcast movie Geeks United. I, I, I do a lot of research about this and I, uh, a lot of these labels uh, like Kino Lorber and um, uh, I'm trying to think of something. Arrow. Screen Factory, Shout Arrow. Factory, some of those guys. Yeah. Yeah, Arrow. Vinegar yeah, Syndrome. They are putting these films Is that one? Out. Vinegar Syndrome, yes. They're putting these films out because the people who run these studios don't even know what's in their library. It's the people who are running these boutique labels. They literally do not know. And so that's why they're getting package deals on these films. And, and it's basically like, well, here they are. Do whatever you want to with them for whatever X number of years. And that's why you see so many of these boutique labels popping up because the people running the studios, they don't even care. They don't care. And that's what's sad about going back to our um, making a circular argument here. Uh, Disney and the Fox library 
unfortunately, they're not doing business with any of these sub licensees. Like uh, they don't have any agreement. Uh, whereas Paramount, Warner Brothers, all those guys, they are licensing some of their titles. Warner Brothers does most of their stuff in house though, with the Warner Archive label. But you do have Sony and you have uh, Paramount and MGM licensing a lot of their titles to these like li- li- these labels that I just mentioned. But Disney is not doing that. They're just sitting on that entire library of Fox titles is just sitting there. Occasionally, they will license something to Criterion. They did do another Mazursky film about two years ago, Unmarried, An Unmarried Woman, which I'm also a huge fan of, uh, another great Mazursky film. They did license that to Criterion, but that is one of the few that they've done. Uh, they are licensing WALL-E to the Criterion uh, label, and there's a there's a Criterion coming out of that on that, uh, I think. Really? Month, November. Yes, and it's going to be the first venture between Criterion and Walt Disney Corporation. So we're hoping that that is a sign that things might change. Uh, That may be, uh, but yes, the fact that WALL-E is going to be issued by the Criterion label is uh, is something to think about. But, you know, this is, uh, these Fox titles like Harry and Tonto, they're just in limbo. The other is a film we talked about before we turned the, the, uh, uh, before we started recording is one of my favorite horror films of all time from 1972. And it's, it's completely out of print and it's a 20th century Fox title. And, um, it's just, you know, the, the only way you can get it is to see it on YouTube if you can or any of these other places. And it's just uh, that's where we're at. So that goes back to, uh, you know, people who loved film don't run these operations anymore. And that's a, I know I'm long winded here. So, well, I, I would I would append to what you just said. The other thing is, you know, everybody always complains about movie piracy, right? Like that that's a genuine complaint. You wouldn't steal a car. Sure. You wouldn't steal a DVD. I would steal a fucking DVD if you don't provide me a way to watch it, motherfuckers. Like, Agreed. Agreed. I'm sorry. Agreed. I the amount of time and effort spent to find this movie between Otto and I alone is a pain in the ass. He had to watch it in the library. He went and found a physical fucking copy. I found a Russian audio language version. Like that's it's 2022 folks. Why, why, yeah. why are we struggling here? And, and frankly, as far as I'm concerned, Disney, the first movie they ever should have done with criterion should have been song of the South. Put your money where your mouth is guys. Cause knock agreed, it the fuck off. Agreed. It existed. You well, can't they're, cover they're it. They're not up. gonna. You, you know they're not. I know it. they already. They've already dealt with. They've already dealt with the lasting uh, effects of the ride or their or, or the movie because they're now getting rid of the ride at Disney, which is fine, yeah. obviously. But can't pretend it didn't happen. The internet exists. And to put Wally like wow, why don't we just why don't why don't yeah. we just hit the biggest baseball with the biggest bat possible? Because that's what you're doing. It's not <laughs> none of that is surprising. It's frankly more it's frankly more disappointing than anything else because it's just further reinforcing exactly what you're talking about, Adam. Which is a a move <laughs> away from a move away from interesting things that people haven't seen being put to good use. I. I God only knows how many movies are sitting in the backlog that no, uh, we haven't even mentioned. So many, just sure. But a Alien and yeah, Predator, well, and that's all we really care about are the things that we can make ten million more of them. Right. Well, the Straight Story is another example. This, David this movie film. reminds me of that uh, movie as well a little bit. Right. It's a that is a nineteen ninety eight Disney production. That was a a Walt Disney film. It wasn't Touchstone or any of those. It was it said Walt Disney on. It wasn't Buena Vista uh, Studios when it no. It wasn't Buena Vista. It was a Walt Disney release. Uh, again in limbo because this is the kind of thing that they just don't care about. And uh, and you also think about the Disney films that were being made thirty years ago. What's love got to do with it? Uh, the Tina Turner biopic. Uh, Nixon, uh, the biopic of Richard Nixon, the Oliver Stone film, those are all Disney titles that, uh, you know, what's love got to do with it, with Meg Ryan. Those are Disney titles that uh, they're just in limbo. And it's sad because those are great films. Well, and it it also, again, speaks to this this issue of when we sit here and talk about a movie like Harry and Tonto that had a Oscar winning performance in it and people at Disney or 20th Century Fox, it, it that that is not the motivator. A good performance is not the motivator. An interesting movie is not the motivator. And that's why what you do, Adam, what you do, Otto, and what I do, bringing light to and appealing to and giving people, like the more people that watch it and ask for it, theoretically should yield 
this movie being re-released somehow, theoretically. Kino and Vinegar and Arrow have kind of said as much that we will release things if people are asking for them, if we have access to them. But yeah. if you don't have access, you're never going to see them. And it's nope. it's not going to be on Disney+, Plus, but it could be. It could. There's actually no reason it can't be. And I think if they would, uh, you know, agree to a licensing deal, I could see this film getting a why. Why release not? By Criterion or King. Right. It yeah. Would. It deserves would. it even because they because they know the importance of Paul Mazursky's work. They've previously issued an unmarried woman, as I mentioned, and that's another Mazursky film. Why wouldn't they issue this? One? So uh, if if it was available, but they're not making it available. They're just sitting on it. And I've heard that. You know, places like the New Beverly Cinema, the repertory theaters, they're having problems too getting prints because Disney will not allow them to have prints of a lot of the Fox titles. They're they're having trouble with that as well. That's another ongoing issue. So it's it's a whole other subject so we could probably talk all night. At this about, point, so. Disney is a menace to society. <laughs> It's it's it, everybody was so excited for Disney to own Fox so that they could have all the Marvel characters and nobody thought about the potential ramifications of Disney owning 20th Century Fox's fucking back of movies. Yeah. Like did no one in their right mind think maybe Disney's not going to give a shit about anything other than the Marvel stuff cuz that's that's clear now. It's pathetically oh, clear yeah. and again your feelings on marvel movies aside stuff like this is more important oh absolutely and and right out of the gate it was evident how much how little they cared because when uh, disney plus started their operations within the first week there were people complaining that the simpsons had been stretched to 16 by 9 the original episodes which were filmed in 4 by 3 so half of the jokes were being it's not a it's not a vis- it's not a visual these- gag show come on no 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 it's all right. dialogue it's really funny when they talk there's no visual <laughs> gags on the simpsons <laughs> it's a general lack of so understanding the- completely right they did they did, they didn't care it was evident that it's like okay here's content Let's put it on here. You know, we don't care that these were carefully composed at 1.33 to 1, these early episodes, with all kinds of jokes in the top of the frames that we're now cutting off because we want to squeeze them to fit a 16 by 9. Well, otherwise people will complain it's not full screen. (laughs) You can't (laughs) win. There's there's no winning Uh, here. (laughs) That's true. true. You got a point. Like I said, we could talk about it this all night long. I I get up on my soapbox about this issue all the time. It's a really what's a far it, reaching so. issue because again, like with TV shows, I mean, you can go get Barney Miller pretty easily. It, it exists. It's on Amazon Prime. But uh, something like this, or so many of these other backlog films, or just films that have been made, just just gone. It, like it, Paul Mazursky's stuff, yeah. geez, even. Here's a question. How many of those 20th Century Fox titles are part of what the Library of Congress, don't they have, don't, doesn't the Library of Congress keep a list of, of films that are significant to the nation's history and cultural history and all that? How many of those titles are on that list? And if they're on that list, shouldn't those titles be available to everybody, no matter who owns them? Well, they probably are. <laughs> they those yeah. movies probably are just I mean, like Alien or Aliens on that list, right? I don't know. You know, the Marilyn Monroe catalog is 20th Century Fox, uh, with the exception of a few. I think maybe some like it hot as a United Artist production, but I think the rest of them are all Fox titles. And to my knowledge, none of those are being streamed anywhere. Uh the only uh, most of them are out of print on Blu-ray. So, uh, you know, the, the whole Marilyn Monroe, we, we think of her as this icon, you know, a Hollywood icon. And yet we can't even get copies of her films. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Uh, Criterion a few months ago, the Criterion channel had um, gentlemen prefer blondes on it. Uh, so you could see it on Criterion and I have some on DVD on old DVDs, but yeah, it, it I, you know, I don't think anyone would disagree with what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, not anybody that yeah. knows anything about this. And again, that it's cares about film would disagree. Right. Well, but but again, but again, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you do have this push now where people don't even want to own physical media. I mean, my God, you know, no. DVDs and Blu-rays, you own physical media. Like, yes, because uh, if my Internet doesn't work tomorrow, what am I going to watch? How am I going to watch anything when net when? Yeah. Plus the well, and when Netflix gets rid of a movie, where am I supposed to go find it? Or you know, it's yeah. it's and again, then you come to something like Harry and Tonto, which I there is nowhere to watch it. Like that is insanity, frankly. 
that there in 2022, there is no platform, not even Tubi, not even, well, again, YouTube, that's just somebody pirating it. But again, if there's nowhere else to watch it, how the fuck is it pirating? That's my question. What are you going to do? Well, you know, uh, uh, speaking of physical media and Disney, they are trying to get out of the physical media business altogether, which is evidenced by the release of uh, Barbarian, their recent box office success. And they're not even putting that out on physical media at all. It's all digital. It's their movie only digital. Uh, that was announced, I think, two or three weeks ago. So it's evident that they're completely moving away. So they don't. They have no interest in physical media. And the thing about physical media that that it's worth re- reminding people, you know, you can stream it. Okay, that's fine, and it probably looks good, uh, good enough. But you can't get the bandwidth that these discs can hold. You know, there's no way. You know, like say a Blu-ray can hold up to 50 gigabytes, a 4K, 100 gigabytes. You know, there's no way you're going to get that picture quality streaming. I don't care where it's at. Uh, there's, it's just not technically. They limit the bandwidth so, intentionally so that you exactly. can't. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. I, I know. And, so, and like so, you guys have mentioned, Harry and Tonto in 4k, I get 50, you get $50 out of me on, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. With a new car. Right. Yeah. And that's, Maybe. and that's the other right. thing that you really miss out on without physical media is commentary, deleted scenes, back, any sort of behind the scenes info, making of people more knowledgeable than myself talking about the movie, you know, scholarly shit. That's not, they don't have that anywhere. I don't even think Criterion has that. So, and if they do, it's not for everything. So. Yeah, it's not for everything, but they do have, I mean, that's one of the things I like. I just started getting this Criterion channel last year because I had cut myself off from cable and the criteria and i so i didn't get tcm anymore and criterion i love because not only do they have classic hollywood films but they have all these great foreign films which are almost you know impossible to see anywhere even harder to find yeah you can't see them anywhere and um but that's one of the great things about uh, the criterion stuff is it, you're right it's not everyone but certain titles they have all these other extras right there on the channel so you can watch it before the movie after the movie and it's really that's great i mean you know but but criterion is like the anti-disney in that sense i mean they're you know they're people who obviously care about the product and the history uh and there's not too many of them unfortunately but even they released yeah. armageddon on criterion collection i'd like to just point that out <laughs> for those of us playing along at home they did release armageddon on criterion collection just I didn't see that, so I don't know. Well, I don't know. <sighs> They've moved away from that uh, in the ensuing years. I kind of wish they'd, they'd moved back towards that sort of thing from time to time. Not all the time, but it would be fun to get some. Remember some when they had like RoboCop kinda... on Criterion Collection? Right. Jesus. Wonderful. Yeah, Wonderful. RoboCop. Yep. I think Absolutely. they had The Rock was on there as well. They yeah, did. yeah, absolutely. You're Criterion all... was a absolutely Criterion right. was weird back in the day. It's 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 definitely re elevated itself to kind of the the high standard now. But there were times mm-hmm. where Criterion was yeah. just whatever, man, do whatever, release whatever you want, man. <laughs> but that's like you mentioned, Adam. These boutique labels. That's the next step in the evolution of this, and I can't yeah. help but wonder if and if Disney will just do it themselves because there is money to be made here and disney is not one to miss out on making money let's put it that way yeah well uh you know they may eventually put these things up for streaming but i don't see a disc release not when they're not even putting out films that are making money currently in theaters like barbarian when they're not even putting that out they're certainly not going to put out an older title like we're talking about that's you know almost 50 years old now so that's just that's an impossibility. So I don't, I don't see it, but you know, maybe streaming, maybe they'll add some more Fox titles to the streaming site. We could hope. Uh, but again, I think we're talking about people who run this company who just, you know, they're looking at the bottom line and whatever they can cannibalize from the Fox library to uh, make a new television series out of, or a new sequel or a new film franchise. So, well, whatever. They're not worried about what <laughs> chief Dan George is up to so much in his jail right. cell in Las Vegas for practicing bad medicine. <laughs> And Chief Dan <laughs> right. George, as far as I'm concerned, practically steals this movie with that. Oh my God! And doesn't he ever? Good wonderful. God! It's fabulous. And and yeah, just quickly because I wanted to hit on some of these these characters that were in this sure. film. 
the guy who plays his friend Jacob at the beginning on the park bench, who he later has to identify, mm -hmm. um, that guy was married to Uta Hagen. His name was uh, Herbert Burgor. And he was married to Uta Hagen, who was like a really, really famous acting teacher in New York City. And he apparently was a big acting teacher who didn't do too many roles. You know, he didn't act too much. He, he liked teaching better. But Mazursky had taken classes with him and asked him if he would play that part. The the cab driver that um, drives Carney when they're leaving Newark Airport, that was an actual cab driver who had, who had driven <laughs> Mazursky somewhere. And he said that she talked all the way. And when she when he got to his office, he said, hey, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I'm making this film. He says, would you be interested in auditioning for me? And she said, sure. So he brought her up to the office, had her read, and he hired her for that. She was not an actress. And he said he was shocked at how well she did and how easily she did those scenes in the car. He said she didn't show any signs of nerves or, or hesitation or anything. He said she did it like 10 different times, 10 different ways. He said she was just fabulous. Um, and then, of course, at the very end, the old lady who hits on Carney at the very end is Sally Marr, who, of course, was Lenny Bruce's mother. And she's he, she's <laughs> she's the uh, the old uh, Jewish lady at the end who's kind of coming on to uh, to uh, Art Carney in the on the beach there. She wants to make him some boiled beef. Boiled he beef. likes that. He likes that boiled <laughs> beef. He says right. he loves it. <laughs> and my other That's favorite true. is Louis Gus, who's the guy on the bus eating the sandwich. <laughs> what kind oh, of sandwich yeah. is it, Otto? What kind of sandwich is he eating? It's a hero sandwich. <laughs> a hero for hero <laughs> for the size, right? Motherfucker, do you want some of my sandwich then? <laughs> Mazursky <laughs> said the only direction he gave him, he, he said he said all I had to say to him was Louis. All I want you to know is you really are enjoying this sandwich. That's it. <laughs> Do whatever you want. And let's not forget the Mazursky cameo uh, when uh, Carney gets to L.A. That's, uh, that's yes. worth mentioning. <laughs> as the male prostitute. <laughs> yes. I mean, there's one thing for casting yourself as the guy who walks by, but casting yourself as a male prostitute in your own movie? I would have liked to have seen Hitchcock right. do that. You're right. <laughs> oh, yeah, boy, that would have been a change of pace. And, the, oh, and the little girl who's making the sandcastle at the end, I don't know if that's, I think it must be Mazursky's daughter, I believe. It is, yeah. yes, you're yeah. correct. Yes, that is right. Yeah. And you know who, uh, of the, the actors playing the children, I think the one that, that gets, uh, that's to me is the most effective is Larry Hagman. I think he really uh, turns in a terrific performance, especially when he breaks down, uh, you know, about all the, the uh, disappointments of his life and the place he is in, in life at that point, you know, and he just finally loses it. It's really, it's quite moving. It's a brief, you know, scene. He's not there for a long time, but it's, uh, it's, but you it's just, very, you just very knew he was a bullshitter though. <laughs> yes. Right. But man, I love Larry Hagman. Like just, what a cool dude in general. Like, I know that in this movie, he's kind of he's playing what you expect. But then obviously it's it's a little against uh, expectation. Obviously, Mazursky's subverting it. But I love Larry Hagman. Just seemed like the coolest dude. Right. And he didn't talk on Sundays. Do you guys know about this? This is a thing. Larry Hagman in the 70s was like, I'm just going to start stop talking on Sunday. He. Yeah, yeah. I heard that. Yeah, he was true. way out there, and I know, I believe he did a lot of experimental drugs. Uh huh. He sure. Did. I have heard <laughs> personal <laughs> stories told to me about joints and bumps shared with Larry Hag. <laughs> I won't say who's told me, but I, I I know that that's a thing. He reminds me a little bit. Speaking of Barney Miller, Max Gale, very similar to Max Gale. Very hippie-ish. Yeah, yeah. Living yeah. in a tent on your own property type thing. Hey, but that's what's cool. And that's what's also funny about Larry Hagman playing the most anti-cool character known to man. Yeah, four years after this. Yeah, boy. It, yeah, he's no, he's, uh, what's yeah. funny is as good as Art Carney is in this movie, everybody else is just as good. I had seen Joshua Mostel in only one other thing. Big Daddy. Oh. 
And fuck, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'd seen his dad, Zero Mostel, pretending to be Kubla Khan in the uh, Rankin and Bass classic, Marco, featuring <laughs> Desi Arnaz Jr. Uh, but I had never seen him in anything else. And he's great in this. He's playing such a, 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 a kind of a typical role that we've seen in these kinds of movies, but doing it in a somewhat subversive way. I mean, I, I like the scene where he's like uh, talking to Ellen Burst. He's like, but you're just a bitch, you know? He's like, I really like you and whatever. He's just, <laughs> yeah. But you are a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, I, I like that because it, it feels like a real human interaction. And, and that's maybe sure. for me what the 70s, was all about was just naturalistic performances and and real per I guess not real performances but it felt like real characters like a, not just a character but like a, a real person and and I h- hope at some point in our film journey we get back to that it feels like those like you mentioned Adam it pops up from time to time but the culture informs it and I I the seventies were a culturally turbulent time in this country and we are living in culturally turbulent times now and i can't help but hope that something from the 70s gets carried over now to people maybe dropping the uh dropping airs and being honest because i think society at this point we're all headed for the apocalypse one way or another might as well enjoy ourselves and drop the auspicious bullshit and and that's what the 70s in a lot of ways reminds me of is just yeah shit kind of sucks but like we're existing all together and we have to figure out a way to make it work and a guy going on a road trip with his cat pretty interesting way to tell that story but i think it works but but you and you have to get it from independent films because mm-hmm. Because they're the only ones who are going to use people who might actually look like real people instead of people who are coming out of the pages of, uh, you know, Vanity Fair or Vogue or something like that, which is seems to be all I see uh, in new in new project. You know, again, if it's an independent, you see you see you still see real people. But if it's a you know, if it's a big budget again, I'm not a big comic book guy so i don't really watch any of those movies but and what you're talking about like naturalistic performances i mean mazursky talked a lot about that with 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 carney because he said you know the things that he did he says i didn't have to direct them he says first of all he was he said he was the first actor i never had to say anything to about the script he said he was the first actor who never came up to me and said i want to change this <laughs> He says he he went by what the script was, and he said he added all of his little physical things. He says, but he never asked to change a line of dialogue at all. There's that one scene at the very beginning where the first scene where he comes into his apartment and he goes and he and he gets the the cat some water, I think, and then he goes and sits down and is going to open the newspaper or whatever. And he's talking about all these little things he did where, you know, he went and got his glasses and he went and how he was moving and all these little things. He said that was all Carney. And he said he moved in a way that older people moved. He changed the rhythm. He said he didn't change how he walked. He just changed the rhythm of the way he walked. And that's like that plays to what you're talking about when you say naturalistic, because it just I think you said this earlier, Chris, how. You just you don't feel like he's acting. You just feel like that's him. That's he's just embodied that person or vice versa. Um, And that's one of those things that is that looks easy on screen when you're seeing it, but probably is not nearly that easy. to pull off as an actor. Good point. Excellent point. Well, and I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Art Carney, did he have anything to prove to anyone in 74 at this point? I mean, my God, right? Like, that's the crazy thing he did, but he didn't. That's the kind of wild thing about this movie is from this newcomer, Art Carney. Art- no, you know what? It's funny you say that because I had forgotten until I was reading up on it this week that his career pretty much was at a dead end at this mm-hmm. point. Um, he had had a nervous breakdown in the mid sixties after his first marriage ended and he had done some, some Broadway work. You know, he was the original Felix Unger in the odd couple on Broadway. And I don't think he and Mathau got along very well. And, um, and he, he really was, he was, his career was kind of at a dead end at this point. And this brought him back, you know, it's other than, uh, he had been. 
he had had this small cameo role in a film in the 30s or 40s because he used to be a a singer and a performer with an old big band called the Horace Height Orchestra. And so he had been in, you know, had like a little cameo role in some film they were in in the 30s or 40s. Then he was not in another movie until sometime in the 60s. And this was only like the second feature film he did. And then after this, he does The Late Show with Lily Tomlin, which is a good movie. I like that movie. And uh, Going in Style with um, George Burns and uh, Strasburg. Yes, I love Going in Style. Um, but this, but Harry and Tonto kind of opened all that up for him. And just think, four years later, he's uh, in the Star Wars Holiday Special, which, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, is really the height of anybody's <laughs> acting career. Harvey <laughs> Corman as well. Whipster. I mean, I have to say nothing else other than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's our Carney's career is it's interesting where his career ended as well of all things fucking last action hero yeah true yeah but to be I, I do love that movie I I, I end your career opposite Schwarzenegger <laughs> dying in the arms of Schwarzenegger nonetheless even yeah, yeah. no he's had an our Carney's career is I mean, again, you, very few films would you have to be in as good as this one. He could have stopped making movies after this. But like, I don't need to do anything else. Like, what, what do I need to say? But glad he didn't. But yeah, I, what a career, right? Just yeah, he, 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 it was it's a brilliant, brilliant performance. And uh, and I, I I don't know. I'm thrilled. Uh, seriously, I'm actually thrilled that you liked it so much, Chris. Cause oh, I, yeah, I, I, I really you. enjoyed it. I wasn't sure how you would respond yeah. to this one. Yeah, that pleases me. To <laughs> I hated this movie. No, I, I, I'm not saying that I expected it. <laughs> it's from 74. How dare you? Right. I, just didn't know I get it. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Well, and again, I mean, to, to both of your points, I mean, it, it, I, I could have been like, well, I mean, it's fine, but but and had the same response that y'all did, where it's I need to watch it again, probably 10 to 15 years from now. And, you know, I will probably enjoy it more the older I get because it will be in my rotation of movies that I will watch again and or show other people or mention to other people to search out. But this is going to be one of those movies that I do return to because, again, I think I think clearly for both of y'all, it has gotten better with repeat viewings and especially repeat viewings with distance in between them. Right. You watch a movie four times a year. What are you really getting out of it? But you watch a movie one time every five years. Might be getting something a little different out of it. Not every movie needs to be reappraised, for fuck's you, sake. You just need to find one of these library copies at a sale somewhere so you can. <laughs> I I can only imagine how much that's worth. Like that <laughs> <laughs> that DVD has to be worth something, right? Like how did I want that commentary? Because I don't have that commentary. Yeah. How did so. they get that? Is my question. Like, why do they have that copy? Just auto, just lose it. Just uh, I put it in the return box. And, uh, you never got it back. Sorry. This came out. This came out in two thousand and five. Holy cow! So, hmm. huh? I wasn't yeah. far off. I was, I was close. I said yeah. early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the poster too. We didn't mention the poster, but the poster's great. But the thumb and oh, the, yeah. oh man. Yeah, this, the poster screams yeah. 70s, the movie screams 70s. And then Art Carney just, uh, what, what more can you say? Yeah. This is a great. I know, ab- a- absolutely. So I-, I will give each of you an opportunity to have your final thought on the movie. What, uh, what, what are, what are your uh, final thoughts on uh, Harry and Tonto, Adam? Well, like I said, it's just a beautiful film that that really is a uh, terrific rumination on the uh, on uh, people who are elder statesmen or or elder stateswomen, I guess you would say, <laughs> in life. You know, it's it's a rumination on the uh, the circle of life. I guess that's a better way to put it. That's that's more succinctly putting it. Um, it's a it's a good um, you know because that's essentially what it does. Uh, the film becomes full circle and. Uh, it's just a, a a terrific rumination on what uh, life has in store if you reach a certain age, and uh, you know it's just like I said just beautifully acted and very very well and meaning uh, beautifully done. What about you, Otto? Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's for the kind of movie that it is. It's really perfect. I mean, it is it's well written, it's well shot, it's incredibly acted. Uh, I mean, it is really like a, a, a an, an actor's masterclass, uh, quite honestly, in terms of what in, uh, uh, what uh, Carney does with it. And like you said, um, all the supporting roles are really wonderful as well. 
And it is, uh, it's a basically a poignant look at not only aging, but also just how important we are to one another. <laughs> how those connections, you know, I keep reading all these articles as I get older saying, oh, the older you get, you have to keep that social network alive. It's very important to your mental well-being and all that stuff. And that's kind of what this is about as well. So it it has, even though you might think it's just an, a, a movie that is for an older person, it really has something for everybody. Yeah, so I, it's a great film. And as for me, I'd never seen it before. And I, I've seen it three times now. And yeah, it's uh, very few movies move me to tears the way this film did. And very few movies have a staying power in my mind the way this one did. And yeah, you know, as we continue to get older all at the same time, it's, uh, it, it, yeah, like you mentioned, it's important to kind of remember a lot of uh, social issues, social cues, remembering how important it is to be part of society as opposed to removing yourself. And yeah, it's, I'm not going to say it's a perfect movie, but I don't know anything we said about it that we didn't like. So I, very few podcasts of my show have we ever had no negative things to say about a movie. <laughs> I'm, so so there you go. Uh, so yeah, so on that note, we'll take a break and we'll play a preview for the next Culture Cast of November. <laughs> you met a girl on the path you knew. You had a brief conversation. You continued on. You never saw her again. That's all that happened. So I can take the test well. Everybody gets a little nervous on these things. One man suspected of murder. We have relatively few leads at the moment, except for a phone number found in a dead girl's pocket. Your phone number, Mr. Willen. Two cops trying to find the truth. What are you not telling us? Well, there's a lot of things I'm not telling you. But as the machine keeps running, Prevents seizures. I'm an epileptic alcoholic, but I'm not a liar. People with temporal lobe epilepsy make your skin crawl for a reason. If you think he's being seized, don't turn your back on him. The tables keep turning. You think I don't know about both of you? I am rich. I know you got a gambling problem. Guys like you don't bet on long shots and win. I'd be careful if I were you. You come looking, you might not like what you find. Deceiver, a Pate Brothers film. That's right. On the next Culture Cast of November, we're going to be talking about 1997's Deceiver, uh, which I've never seen. But I would ask either one of you, do you know what actress is in that movie that led me to that movie from this movie? Because she's in both of them. Is it got to be Ellen Burstyn? It is Ellen Burstyn. Oh, yep. My Ellen Burstyn is in Deceiver. I have never seen it, but it stars Tim Roth and Chris Penn and Ellen Burstyn. So I don't know. Um uh, could be good, could be bad. I don't know. Neither one of you are saying anything about it, so I would be led to believe neither one of you have seen it. So I have not. Seen it. <laughs> I, have not. I was I have hoping not. one of you had seen it, so you could be like, "Oh God, it's terrible." But like, "Oh God, never mind." <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess I'm wandering into it uh, sight unseen, which is exciting. So uh, I will be joined by my co-host for the Scary Stories We Tell podcast, Jess Byard, on that episode. But until then. Where could people find you, Otto, if they were to hunt you down on the internet? Uh, if they could hunt me down on the internet, well, I guess you could find me on um, Facebook at the Sinatra and Company Facebook page, because that's one of my radio shows, or at uh, jazz90.1.org, which is this jazz radio station where I do my shows. Um, that's basically where they could find me. And of course, they can find the Barney Miller book at either Bear Manor Media or Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any place like that. And you should, because the Barney Miller book's awesome. It right. is. It's a fucking tome, too. You will get your, you will get your goddamn money's worth, you, folks. You it's, will not be it's literally this thick. It is a, if there is another book written on Barney Miller, they're wasting their time. Let's just put it that way. 560 pages. Yeah, that's longer than a lot of narrative books. And it's 560 giant pages. Like <laughs> this, it's not paperback either so it's it's the i would say it's the definitive barney miller book wouldn't you Otto? i hope so i i i, I think so that's, that's how it was planned what about you adam where can people find you if they were looking for you on the internet 
Well, you know, you can find me at the usual social media outlets on Facebook. You can search, search me by name, Adam Long, and uh, at uh, Twitter at AdamFilmFan1970 is my handle there. And uh, I also do a weekly uh, movie roundup at FocusNewspaper.com. That's a, a local um, uh, indie newspaper that uh, is in the area. We serve uh, about 10 counties and the uh, I'm in the North Carolina and the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So uh, we we have a subscriber reader weekly reader base of about 100,000 readers a week, something like that. And and then Movie Geeks United. I'm a, I do a monthly podcast roundup of all the physical media releases of the previous month. We'll be doing another one this coming Sunday and it will be posted soon. And occasionally I do the anniversary shows. Um, I haven't done a lot here of late because my father passed away uh, several months ago and we're just settling. I'm dealing with all that right now. So time has been kind of short. Um, but last year I was able to reunite the cast from the movie Summer 42. And we did a, a Zoom reunion with all of them, except for Gary Grimes, uh, who I could not get. I tried, believe you me, I tried. But uh, the rest of them, Jennifer O'Neill and uh, Jerry Hauser and Oliver Conan, I was able to get them together for 50th anniversary. You can find that on YouTube if you just uh, type in the Summer 42 50th. And uh, it's about a 90-minute chat with the cast of Summer 42. And I also... Um, a while back, I interviewed the uh, the editor of Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back, Paul Hurst. That's up there as a video too on YouTube. So you can uh, there's some stuff. You know, occasionally I will do the uh, the reunion show, as it were, like that. So I, I um, you can find some of those on the Movie Geeks United, uh, you know, site. So there you go. <laughs> And as for me, you can find me at weirdingwaymedia.com, where along with this and 18 other shows, we've got a little podcast network that Mike White of many shows, including the Barney Miller podcast, and I put together that network together so we would have a place for all the shows that we already work together on. So Weirding Way Media is where you can go to find this show and many more. And it's not just movies. It's spooky and supernatural stuff and weird things and pop culture stuff. Just, just go there. You'll, you'll see. You'll understand. And then you won't have to listen to me tell you. You'll just get it. Uh, as for this show, culturecast.com, patreon.com slash culturecast, blah, blah, blah. Financially, if you want to support us, cool. If not, I get it. Shit sucks. Times are hard. And I need money, too, which is why I'm asking you for money. But if you don't want to give me money, I get why you're holding on to it. So if you want if you want to help out non-financially, rate, review and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get this show, which is more than likely iTunes. Hey, Chris, uh, Otto, yes. I have a question for you from a fan. Oh, who a friend of mine who listens to your Rankin Bass podcast oh no here we go he says is he gonna do a tribute show to jules bass Ooh, uh yeah, I, I am now <laughs> oh, but i'm gonna i am going to isn't he the one uh, that just passed away he did he he I did which is funny because um similarly to jerry lee lewis i did not know that jules bass was still alive <laughs> <laughs> I was so, kind of surprised by that myself. Go figure. So I, I guess we will now. So thank you for that, Otto. That's that is a valid and good point. Yes, uh, my friend Doctor <laughs> Finn Madigan listens to your Rankin Bass podcast all the time, and he just said to me, I told him I was going to be on with you tonight, and he said. I want to know, ask him if he's going to do a tribute show to Jules Bass. Yeah, well, I guess I have to now since you put me on the spot. So, there you go. so Adam, Otto, thank you both so much for joining me. I hope you guys both had a good time, given that neither one of you, uh, I've talked to Otto before, but Adam, this is fucking knew each other for five minutes. So there you go. So I hope you guys <laughs> both had a good time. And um, yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. And it was great uh, meeting both Likewise. of you. Likewise. Absolutely. I, I totally, totally enjoyed it. And uh, I uh, I will probably send you a friend request, yes, Otto, would, if you're uh, Please do, Facebook. because I'm going to probably go check out that uh, Summer of 42 uh, reunion, because you said Summer of 42. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> cool. I'd like to see that. Well, if you enjoyed the movie, I got them to tell some really good personal stories about the production cool. of the film. And uh, I just kind of moderated it and let them go. I I tried not to get in their way and just uh, I just got them all on and um, I was able. It took a lot of work to get Jennifer O'Neill. The other two were pretty easy, but uh, she was she was a little bit yeah. difficult. Uh, she was going to do it. She wasn't going to do it. She was going to do it. She was. I had to. Uh, it's a whole long saga. We could do a whole podcast. <laughs> but, we won't. Uh, but eventually she came through and she had a little bit of an attitude in the beginning. 
But that melted away, and by the time it was over with, she genuinely, I think, had a good time because she thanked me profusely for doing it. Yeah, I'll check that out. Don't actors just like to talk about the things that nobody else is talking about? Like, I don't know. Right. Where's Art Carney at? Let's go find yeah. Art Carney, and we'll talk to him about Harry. And I talk. wish so. we could. So, yeah. I wish we could. I'd be the first. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. So, <laughs> so, uh, so on that note, we'll uh, we'll catch you on the next episode.